latest episode of uh, Back to the Basics here on GGU Presents. Um, my name is Mark Singer. I'm Dean of the School of Undergraduate Studies at Golden Gate University. And I'm really thrilled to have um, with me today um, our guest, uh, Von Tung Quinlevan, who's the CEO of uh, Futuro Health. And I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Von before we uh, start talking. Uh, Vaughn's a nationally recognized thought leader in workforce development, and her distinguished career spans the public, private, and nonprofit cent, uh, sectors. And most recently, um, Vaughn served as the Executive Vice Chancellor of Workforce and Digital Futures of the California Community Colleges, which, uh, as many of you will know, that's the largest higher education system in the country with 115 institutions, perhaps 116 now with that new one. Um, and um, so she, she was responsible for growing public investments from $100 million to more than a billion dollars during her tenure. And that was um, something she did by establishing workforce as a state policy priority. But before um, she went into higher education, Vaughn oversaw workforce development for PG&E. Uh, she's won numerous awards, a frequent speaker on workforce development, and she's been quoted in numerous publications, including the New York Times, US News and World Report, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. And, um, uh, oh, and also I should mention, uh, uh, Vaughn earned her master's degrees from the Stanford Graduate School of Education and the Stanford Grad School of Business, um, went to Georgetown. And um, besides um, serving on the Board of Trustees for Golden Gate University, Vaughn's also on the boards of the National Skills Coalition, Western Governors University, and California Forward. And um, she also advises the education-focused venture fund achieve partners. So uh, Vaughn, welcome very much. I'm really excited to have you here. Thanks for, for joining us. I'm delighted to join you, Mark. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, thanks. And did I get most of that right? Is that anything I, should I left out? Uh, <laughs> it's a great introduction. <laughs> Hope to live up to it. All right. Well, let's see what, yeah, I, I'm sure it'll, it'll be fun. So so why don't I, I just ask you, um, how, how did you get on this trajectory, you know, from workforce development to the California Community Colleges to now being CEO of Futuro Health. Is that a logical path that somebody might normally take? Well, um, Mark, as you know, careers often zig and zag, uh, as well as uh, life. I actually had a, a beginning in uh, 1975, my family escaped from the Vietnam War and came to the United States as immigrants. Um, and one of the things that I realized in my own trajectory was that education was available to, well, to me. And thanks to education, whether it was the K-12 system or the college or the graduate school, they all opened doors. And so I feel like my work, my current work, um, is really just to pay it forward to others. Uh, so I did, uh, I began to do workforce development um, with uh, pg e where really learn how to um, do the black and tackle of uh, creating opportunity for people into really good paying jobs that were very little known in the community. And then I was appointed by Governor Brown to be vice chancellor and an executive vice chancellor of the California Community Colleges. And at that time, there was very little visibility and underappreciation for the importance of workforce. And through all the changes that we were able to make, uh, we really took workforce from being an afterthought uh, into being a policy priority for the state. And as you know, when um, a policy has priority, then there's also additional resources. But we had to do a lot of restructuring of the system so that students who were going through workforce programs could successfully land in the workforce. Ah, I see. I, so no, it, it's it's really something that that that's time has come. The idea of workforce uh, development as a priority for education, and that that linkage, which I know we're going to be talking about in a few moments, um, a bit more. Oh, and I should mention, by the way, um, to folks who are who are um, watching us right now live, um, if you have, if you do have a question for Vaughn, um, please post it in the Q and A button down at the bottom. I should have mentioned this at the beginning, uh, not in the chat, uh, but in the Q and A, if you would. And we'll do our best to get to as many questions as uh, come in. All right, um, thanks very much. So, um, so now your 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 current venture um, is with working with Futuro Health, and um, you, you know I think a lot of folks won't be familiar with the model for um, this organization. Would you mind talking about what is Futuro Health and what are they doing now? 
Absolutely. So, you know, in um, California alone, we have a shortage of 500,000 allied health workers. And if you are, I mean, especially in the current pandemic, but also previously, all of us want to have uh, ensure that we have um, our fair share of health workers in our own backyard, right? Um, so this was a very big number that we saw with the growing and growing of, of California. And there's also analogous um, shortages across the country uh, with regards to this workforce. So, you know, some people would ask me, what is the word allied before healthcare? I mean, most people are familiar with healthcare workers like doctors and nurses. Um, allied health workers are those that are trained with more than a bachelor's degree, but less than a bachelor's degree in general. So uh, these are associate degree trained, certificate industry recognized, credential trained. And so think about uh, what would happen if you were to, um, hopefully this doesn't happen, but you know, let's say there were, uh, an, you were in a, a, a car accident. Imagine all the individuals from, who are going to touch you in terms of providing healthcare services. From the ambulance driver that comes, that's an emergency medical technician trained through, is allied health worker trained to this level of credential, to the person who checks you in, takes your vitals and processes all your paperwork, maybe takes your x-rays and, you know, and other, um, uh, and administers other uh, tests of your vitals. So these are all the professionals who are in the allied health category. And so it's, it's a lesser known set of occupations, but as you can imagine, uh, very important, and the spotlight has definitely been shown on them uh, during the pandemic. So we began this work pre-pandemic and uh, launched in January of this year, thanks to a $130 million commitment uh, by Kaiser Permanente and uh, the United Healthcare Workers uh, West, UHW, SEIU um, UHW. Um, they made the investment in starting this nonprofit so that we can do the work to create opportunity and really just to increase the health and wealth of communities by creating the largest network of allied health workers. Because all of us want to make sure that you know we have the health care uh, at the moment of need, but um, including um, as we also age. Right. So right. So this was already a, a, a real need, a real shortage um, prior to the pandemic. Um, it seems even more important now, though. Has, has the focus of Future Health changed at all uh, in the last well, six months now since our shelter in place? Well, I want to acknowledge that it's not only Futura Health and the work that we're doing, but the, everybody's lives have been turned upside down. Everybody's organization has been turned uh, upside down. And I think we're all um, trying to stay, um, um, keep on uh, creating solutions as sort of novel uh, crises come upon all of us. So I, I just want to acknowledge how, how difficult the moment is for all our um, listeners here and as well as you and I. Uh, so in terms of um, Futura Health, you know, our, our specific goal was to create, um, enable 10,000 more credentialed workers in the allied health area over the next four, four years. Now, did that get um, disrupted by the pandemic? Uh, the answer is yes. So we did a pause um, when the pandemic came about and uh, redeployed in or our training of our infrastructure in order to deploy some short-term training, for example, to take licensed vocational nurses who were on, you know, who were in already trained in healthcare, but then needed skills to deal with respirators and deal with much more acute um, situations that were coming up as patients uh, got sick. So we, we, we did some short-term training that was helpful uh, to individuals in 20 states. Um, but we also convened the board and, and asked the question, what is going to be a permanent change from the pandemic versus it being temporal? Because this is a very odd moment in time. You know, usually the out years are much fuzzier than the near term, right? It's usually clearer in the short term than it is in the long term. But this pandemic has created a strange phenomenon where it's clearer, the three-year future is clearer than the one-year future because the three-year future will more likely, you know, the, the probability of having the immunization 
and being able to resume uh you know recover services and and daily operations and our daily lives is is is, is much more likely um and then the sh in the short term we're unsure uh the timing of when all of this will happen so uh in convening my own board we asked that question because as you may be aware doing the short term while everyone is sheltered in place people don't want to go access healthcare and therefore hospitals you would think they're the ones most in need there are hospitals and health clinics their financials have been uh, turned upside down because they can't do elective procedures which has really subsidized a lot of other areas of the hospital so then they're also laying off so it's it's very odd dynamic that's happening so you know like everybody on this on this call we really had to look at all right a little bit longer ahead what do we think is a likely case like what is going to be a permanent change from the pandemic on the healthcare workforce versus a kind of a short-term adjustment while people organizations are dealing with these short-term change and what they said was telehealth is going to be permanent just like tele, you know the tele for the online learning is going to become um, probably a permanent element a much more permanent element of, of the higher education ex experience um, so telehealth is one of those uh, skill sets so it's incredible to believe that there's actually already technology where in, instead of going into the doctor and taking your vitals for your you know your physical you can actually receive a set of equipment by mail you can then upload all these uh, uh, data and then you're you're in a virtual room they call it virtual rooming uh to begin the conversation with your medical provider on what issues you're facing um so that was um that uh practice of going tele was was a bit of um kind of on the fringe and now all of a sudden proportionately it is the the thing to do right consumers are liking it um and uh, hospitals and other healthcare providers are having to do it. And so this is going to be a, a permanent element of the, the workforce. Now, Mark, maybe something you ask is, how does that change people's skill sets, right? Yeah, exactly. so, so if you ask a doctor, one of the d things the doctors say is, you know, at the moment you're wrapping up the, the time with your doctor and the doctor is reaching for that doorknob, right? That's the moment where most patients apparently say well I, I may have one more issue that i'd like to talk about right so right, right. <laughs> right. or um you know another doctor shared that uh, in order to help um, a mother begin to engage in the the diagnostic dialogue she would um hold the baby and soothe the baby and that actually comforts the mother and gets the mother in a place where they can talk about medical issues so all of these physical cues of sort of the trust and um, the, the dynamic between the patient and the, uh, the provider, that's all being shifted by this virtual experience. So how do you express empathy? How do you convey cultural competence? Uh, th there's so many um, elements of what we assume and expect in a physical world that now we have to translate, well, what does actually work in the virtual world in terms of uh, patient and um, provider interaction. So these are skill sets, right? In, in addition to not only um, that, but also how do you work with your care? If you if you are a healthcare worker, how do you collaborate with your care team that is all virtual, just like what we're doing right now? And so you know, these are all good. skills. Right, right. No, and, and we, we wrestle with that same thing in education, right? If you once you move from the in-person classroom to an online setting, how do That's you right. keep that empathy, that, that sort of sense of, of belonging and togetherness. Um, it, it's funny because as you were talking, I was thinking, well, it, it sounds like uh, health uh, care workers and people in allied health also need to become more tech workers um, if, if we're heading the way you're, you're talking about. Like for me, in this case, I have to at least know how to use Zoom. Um, is that something that uh, we need to think about incorporating into uh, training and education for allied health uh, workers as well? Uh, absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, you know, 
it used to be that, hey, you really care about working with patients, right? You, you, you enjoy caring. And that's what brought you into healthcare. All right. So even at the entry level, now the person who checks you in, not only do they have to provide the care, not only do they have to um, have the technical knowledge of how to do their job, now all of a sudden they have to debug your technology and troubleshoot uh, because you're uploading all that data from the home, right? So they have to ready you for your visit with your, your virtual visit with your doctor. Uh, is that a skill set that is more akin to um, the, the guys from Best Buys or gals from Best Buys who come out uh, to your house, right? So these are different skill sets that are coming together and making the role much more complicated. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, I mean, this moment in time has really shown uh, I, I know you've heard it before, but there's sort of the digital divide, right? So right. not only is the access to the bandwidth and the technology and the skill set of, of being able to access um, these tools uh, important for your uh, consumption of education, but now it's becoming important to your consumption of healthcare. So, so as a general policy, it's, it's um, the haves and have not are being determined by access to broadband broadband, right, and, and technology. Right, no, and as somebody just uh, mentioned in the, in the Q&A here that um, there's also the uh, question of implicit bias. Um, so it's a digital divide that's economic, but there's also racial and, and, and cultural um, divides in terms of healthcare. Um, that's something we also, I presume, need to think about addressing in, our, in, in the way we educate our allied healthcare workers and, and others. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, so it's it's the um, you know one of the the key premise we have is how do we how do we get into communities to scout and recruit candidates so that they can then uh, get their uh, credential and enter the healthcare field. So for example, um, we have a program called uh, English Readiness for Allied Health. So if you're not confident about your English, you're interested may be interested in a healthcare career building up your language skills so before you entering the um, the the medical assistant program for example um, that's going to open up access and again um, for those who are haven't looked at the demographics of, of of california it's always been an issue uh to be able to grow um to be able to keep people Right. It's so expensive in California. So the sort of one of the best strategy is that instead of recruiting people from out of state is how do you grow people locally because they already know about the cost of living um, issues and they want to stay here. Uh, so, that, you know, that's the work of um, scouting, recruiting and then also providing the opportunity to um, to education pathways. Uh, so, you know, it, I'm glad you mentioned education pathways because, of course, you know, we're a university, so that's something that uh, I know of interest to, to a number of the folks who will be listening now. Um, and, and I want to mention that, uh, you know, as I, as I was talking, introducing you, um, I was saying this is some, your work in this area, uh, thinking about the future of work, long predates uh, the pandemic, right? And, and so you've um, been talking about new paradigms, new approaches to education for a while. I've, I've been struck by a phrase that you use, and in fact, I used it just this morning, the idea of uh, education changing so that people um, get regular booster shots, if you will. Uh, you, you know, that it's not just uh, mm -hmm. training that you get and then you're set for life, but uh, it's really a whole structural change to how we think about education that you've been speaking about and advocating for. Um, are, you, are you seeing that in area? You, you must be seeing that in areas beyond the allied health field as well, a need for that sort of change. Absolutely. I mean, so if you if you look at the education system as a structure, right, um, it is structured on a paradigm where basically you try to get uh, like your education inoculation, the highest level of inoculation that you can up front, right? So whether it's a bachelor degree, a master's degree, or or beyond, and then. Um, and all the resources are focused there in terms of student financial aid, et cetera. But the reality is this, this economy has been shifting over time and it's not just a one-time inoculation, it's a set of booster shots throughout your life. Uh, I think we had heard it called continuous learning, but it's much more specific. I mean, so just think about it. In the middle of the night when you're sleeping, what happens to your technology? 
it automatically upgrades. It gets its booster shot, right? So how are we getting our booster shot in terms of skills in order to stay current and to stay, stay abreast? And how do we set up structures so that people can actually afford being able to do those booster shots on a regular basis? Um, even just the model of one-time inoculation has been very strained with, with the level of financial aid and public, you know, uh, public funds um, are just inadequate to support everyone getting that, that uh, one-time uh, inoculation. Um, we, there are some good practices on corporations and companies to be able to help uh, their workers get booster shots, um, such as tuition, uh, disbursement. You know, some companies have tuition reimbursement, but when you're talking about working adults, what the best practice has been is that they many struggle with being able to finance the tuition. And so having it paid up front rather than after the fact actually really helps people with cash flow and more people are able to take advantage of education benefits that way. And then, yeah, go ahead. No, please, please go ahead. No, um, uh, so I think we have to just uh, think about how do we design for systems where people can come in and out um, and make it adult friendly. Uh, so Futura Health is in the space of just thinking through the, the adult journey for learning and how do you come back and get uh, credentials, uh, you know, stack your credential over time so that you can uh, move up but also stay current. Oh, interesting. And you, you mentioned employers and their role here there's a benefit to employers as well, not just to the individuals who are getting this education. Yeah. Well, you know, for employers, it's, um, um, you know, right now, I, I think many are just really thinking about how do they reopen, right? How to reopen, how do they uh, deal with the, with the burn rate so that they can manage to stay open and keep as many employed as possible. So, um, so that's first and foremost um, on their mind. And what we hope is that they continue. We, we were seeing over the years that there were more and more employers who were uh, beginning to offer even the frontline workers uh, assistance in tuition and in education, uh, not just even to stay in the company, but to be able to go elsewhere from Starbucks to Walmart to Amazon, offering frontline workers the ability to skill up uh, so that they could be more ready with, with uh, more skills. And so these were all really good practices uh, directionally correct for the country. And I just hope that these benefits will be um, continued during this time. Yeah, that is a, that is a question that's, that, that's on our minds as well. I know some companies are cutting back right now. Um, I, I'm hoping they resume, but uh, it seems like they'd, um, that companies and others, you know, unions and, and, and other organizations would have a real interest in making sure that there's a, uh, a set of uh, skilled skilled workers, a pool of skilled workers who are who are also capable of adding to and enhancing their skills as they go. So that's uh, um, did you see do you see any trends um, in, in that area uh, just yet, or is it too soon? Well, um, so I think something that to uh, to consider on the on on the higher education side is. You know, we're, we're seeing shifts in, in workforce needs. And I'll just give you a healthcare one. I know there are different examples in different in, uh, industries, but for example, this pandemic is going to give rise to more mental health issues, right? So, you know, you and I have had a conversation about, well, how do you create the, the health, health worker? Many of them are trained at the master's level which is very high and a lot of debt. So how do we get more from communities to be able to get to that level? Um, in addition to maybe rethinking the structure of the jobs and what can be done um, with less, uh, with credentials that don't take as long. So I think on the edu higher education side, it's just really th rethinking, how do you take somebody who may be a licensed vocational nurse, who's, that's a two year uh, of training. How do you accelerate their movement into uh, a master's level to be able to deliver mental health service. Because if we don't do those types of accelerated programs, then we won't have the ability to, to, to get a, uh, the needed workforce and, and especially a culturally competent uh, workforce um, that can navigate all our respective communities. 
So I think the, there's a lot of redesigning that is in play right now uh, it's, um, to help workers as well as to help um, employers be able to deal with the moment. I see. All right. I, I want to um, remind folks if they would like to ask questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A um, and we'll, we'll do our best to, uh, to tackle those. Um, and somebody actually has posted a question there that I think is um, very relevant to what you're talking about now because um, it, there's... Uh, while we definitely need to upskill these workers uh, that you're talking about, in, in, in the case you just described, the, L, the LVNs, licensed vocational nurses, um, there's, there's also at the same time something uh, sort of gaining on them, if you will. And, and the, the, the questioner asked about uh, AI, uh, you know, and whether or not that could conceivably replace people, um, at, you know, at, at various levels. And if that's the case, maybe that is... Uh, uh, some incentive for people to continue to acquire new skills? Well, one of the things that we saw in the last recession was the beginning of what I call the decoupling of the worker and the work, right? So in, in the past, it used to be that uh, when you have troubled times, you reduce workers, but you will also see a corresponding decrease in productivity of the company. But then a lot of technology was actually adopted during that time. And so in the last recession, it was the first time that we saw a reduction of worker, but not a reduction of productivity, mm. right? So all of a sudden, work and workers became decoupled, right? And so when the hiring began, it wasn't hiring for the same thing. It was then hiring for different uh, skill sets. So the jobs had changed in nature. Now, you know, in healthcare, for example, uh, but also in manufacturing, like it's, it's all across the board. I mean, you can even see it in, in, in retail, right? Instead of um, when you're going up to the counter to go buy food, instead of uh, having a person interact with you, you're, you're interacting with the iPad, your orders are being taken by the iPad, right? So that's a form of automation of a job that used to be done um, by a person. So I think we all have to look at the, the roles that we do and really think, is it prone to repetition? Uh, is it repeatable processes? And so those are the types of roles that are more likely to be automated versus roles that don't have those characteristics in them. Um, and then as we look at our own occupation, our own industry, you know, running it through that lens, it will help you you have a feel for whether or not you should worry more or, uh, or you know, worry less um, uh, about skilling up or, or reskilling, you know. So you, you would definitely want to um, think about what are the skill sets where there's less automate, uh, you know, less repetition mm -hmm. and then begin building those skill sets um, active, proactively. Ah, all right. So it's what I, I've read uh, by Joseph Aoun. Um, um, he used the phrase um, making people robot proof, essentially. Yeah. Um, right. So less susceptible to these kinds of uh, encroachments on their on what they do. It's interesting. Um, so in, in your work, um, well, you mentioned uh, employers that are taking more responsibility for uh, education on, them, on their own. Um, do you see a role for universities to play or is this something that's going to be taken on more and more by the organizations themselves who are training their own workers for the future? I think we need both. Um, I mean, in this moment in time, there's a lot of dorm closing and, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, unbundling of higher education, uh, of traditional higher education, right? So you have learning being unbundled from the dorm experience or the in-person socialization or the party, you know, like all of that is being unbundled. Um, I think there's some expectation that if it's a kind of a campus dorm residency based uh, higher education institution, a lot of that will then revert, you know, once the pandemic, um, once we have immunization um, figured out. But for organizations that are more focused on adult and the adult journey, and the adult journey is very complicated. I think this is an opportunity for us collectively to redesign how should the education experience be designed for adults who are awfully busy, who need flexibility, who need affordability, what kind of bundles of education services, but also the student supports 
the mentorships, uh, the co-op internship or apprenticeships, like the, the on-the-job experience, and what which combinations come together uh, to really help an adult move successfully through. I think Golden Gate University has repeatedly won awards for, for being adult uh, adult friendly. Um, but I think largely many, many um, higher education institutions are being challenged at this moment of time to rethink how do you rebundle and reassemble the higher education experience so that it is adult friendly because somebody's got to deliver the booster shots. People want the booster shots. It'd be great to be able to go back to your higher education institution to be able to get that. Um, but we have to we have to really design um, how it's it comes back together so that that it's adult friendly. Mm. So you're, you're talking a bit more about a, a lot about the process and just just the the whole experience for students. But um, so if, if, but if I were to plan, which I'm trying to right now in my role um, for our curriculum. Are there certain like well, how would I plan for um, for what we're going to need in the future? Like, that, uh, are there certain subject areas, or is it more about that unbundled experience that uh, you just helping people get where they need to go? Like, um, what's can you give me some advice? I guess that's my question. <laughs> Mark, you're thinking about it already. I mean, one of the things that is. Um, we know that the shelf life of skills is very short, you know, has gotten shorter. So, um, you know, one strategy with that is to modularize some of the education components, right? So what are the stackable credentials that you can embed um, along the way um, as you're earning a uh, degree so that you're having both uh, the degree as well as some um, skill sets that are recognizable uh, more skill sets that are recognizable by employers. Um, I think also in this moment in time, the soft skills or the interpersonal skills, the human plus skills, uh, power skills, whatever you want to call them, those will be the transferable skills. And so how to manifest those in Zoom and, uh, and other virtual environments as well as physical environments, uh, they become even more important because they are less prone to the automation that you had reference. Um, so how to develop those, but how to make it also explicit uh, in form of uh, whether it's your badge so that you can share and, and um, uh, brag about those skills to uh, prospective employers. Um, so how to make those transparent uh, will, will be important. So thinking about that, but also the currency of the curriculum is really important. And I know Golden Gate University has been focused on the uh, genome restructuring, looking at what's current in the labor market um, and refreshing all the programs so that students can be sure to um, get what is valued uh, by the labor market. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting how you're describing this because I'm thinking as you're saying this that it's not only our students who have to be adaptable and flexible and, and learn um, uh, you get these booster shots and, and accommodate changes, but but it's really also um, employers and, and in the case you're describing universities that have to take that advice to heart themselves, right? And 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 get their own booster shots. Is that is that a way to think about it? Yes, yes, yes. And um, I'm, you know, all crisis is uh, also an opportunity. The um, this moment in time, I mean, the pandemic has eliminated our ability to do some of the things that we have traditionally done, right? I mean, it's put all of that on hold. And so it's forced us into more rapid experimentation of, you know, changes in processes. How do we support students differently? How do we le deliver learning differently? How, maybe how we partner with different parties for content so that we can keep up with the rate of change. Um, I think all of this is, um, uh, is, uh, the pandemic has created the the sort of the canvas for all of this to be redesigned. Uh, yeah. So we just have a, a, a couple of minutes, um, but there are a couple of questions that uh, I think they might relate back to your previous work. So I don't know if you'll feel comfortable uh, talking about them. But um, um, one of the questions is uh, well, the question is really about is the California uh, higher ed system doing much to address this right now as a part of the master plan. And, and one person mentioned Calbright as an example of, uh, mm -hmm. is, it, is this something that's now part of the state's overall plan for, uh, for higher education? 
So the California Master Plan, um, there's been several attempts over decades, you know, to relook at, at it. And the latest one, when I had left my um, community college office, actually looked at not only the tiers of education, you know, serving, you know, the, the role of the UC system, the Cal State system, and the community college system, and how they kind of juxtapose against each other. But the biggest change was at, uh, having the conversations around workforce and whose responsibility is it uh, to enable, uh, to ensure that we, the workforce gets what it needs and that the institutions are helping uh, students and individuals successfully land in the workforce. So uh, hopefully those conversations will continue uh, over time. Um, and then the Calbright was the establishment of the 115th college with the community with, with the California Community College, and that was designed to be fully online and statewide. Uh, so it's still in its infancy stage in terms of um, getting ready. I think this is its second year of operation. And um, there's a lot of work to be done um, uh, in, in order to set up an ambitious endeavor like this. So uh, I think we, we need to um, watch and see. And I'm sure like in seven years, 10 years, we'll look backwards and, and wonder you know, why it hadn't been there all along. Yes, I, I'm gonna put a reminder on my calendar for seven years from now. <laughs> That's right. So what, what, what can we expect from, from the work you're doing with the Futura Health right now? Uh, will we be um, seeing more in terms of um, the, the model you're developing there? So what's, oh, um, you know, what's interesting, Mark, is Futura Health is not an education provider by itself. It's, uh, it's actually doing the work to curate um, the, the partners that should come together to deliver on the student journey from where they are to actually uh, where they need to go based on labor market uh, need, right? So, um, you know, for example, if we find out that uh, dental assisting is really in need, who's got the really good programs and how do we remove the friction so that someone can go from where they are to get that credential to, to successfully uh, land in the workforce. So we're beginning to see, you know, we're a nonprofit, but we're, there's also for-profit uh, private sector uh, entities that are, be, that are coming into and uh, working on the space that is like building the ecosystem to come together um, to curate so that it can solve both the needs of the individual, which is, you know, there's too much out there. Somebody's got to curate it for me. And then for the employers, which is, you know, there's too much out there and I, but I need the talent that I need to, you know, today, right? So um, it's, it's uh, so we're, we're, I think we'll see a lot more activity in this space that I'm, I'm, maybe I'm loosely calling, it's ecosystem building, right? Building the higher education ecosystem that is more supportive of, of adults and their um, student journey. So education isn't just this standalone separate activity. It's something that really has to be integrated with um, the future of work and where, where people are and where they live, that sort of thing. Yes, um, yes. Interesting, interesting. Well, listen, I, I, I really want to thank you, Vaughn, for, for taking the time to talk with us. Um, would you mind if I put your Twitter handle in the chat? Because I, I found your, your, your tweets to be really uh, useful, or, or if there's another way to um, uh, for folks to follow what you're up to. Um, oh, absolutely. I uh, love um, to hear from you uh, on my Twitter handle, which is at Workforce Vaughn, V A N. Um, okay, that's in there now. All right. Well, thank you so much, um, Vaughn Tong Quinlevan, who's the CEO of Futura Health. Uh, we're, we're so thrilled you're able to join us today and talk about stuff that, that I love to talk about. So um, I, could, I, could, I could talk to you about this all day. I'm probably going to send you five emails after this, too, about other things. I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to, uh, and, and this will be posted on YouTube. If your friends were not uh, able to join us live today, um, go to the GGU uh, YouTube channel. Um, it takes us a day or two to make this, uh, to clean this up, and then uh, it'll be there for folks to, uh, to share. All right, um, thanks so much for uh, taking the time with us today. Thank you, Mark. Stay safe, everyone.